Well, we are waiting for our last um, panelist. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to this really exciting collaborative session, um, Making the World a Pitter Place. It's up to all of us. Um, so this is a collaboration between uh, DataSite, Crossref, ORCID, and ROAR that was really fun to work on uh, for the last couple of months. And we're really excited to, uh, to come together today to bring you this session. Um, a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, this is part of the DataSite member meeting. Um, and we have a hashtag DataSite21 for all of our open member meeting sessions, if you'd like to tweet about this session. Um, while we are getting started, feel free to introduce yourself in the Zoom chat. And as you noticed when you entered the room, this session is being recorded. We plan to share it publicly on our YouTube channel. Um, we will also share the slides after the session. Uh, if you come up with any questions throughout the session, please use the Q&A tool and we will uh, take those questions at the end of the session. All righty, everyone's here, let's get started. Uh, so welcome everyone. I would like to start with some introductions. Uh, we have a big old group of persistent identifier infrastructure aficionados here. Um, I am Liz Krasnarich from DataSite. I'm the adoption manager at DataSite and also for the ROAR initiative. I'm joined by my colleague at DataSite, Paul Vierka. Um, we have Rachel Lamy from Crossref, who is uh, head of special programs. From ORCID, we have Tom Demerinville and Julie Petro. And also from ROAR, we have Maria Gould, who is the, um, the project lead there. And I'm sorry, I should say Tom is the product director at ORCID and Julie is the communications director at ORCID. So why are we all here? And when I say we, I mean the folks who are presenting today from DataSite, Crossref, ORCID, and ROAR. Uh, we are different organizations, obviously, but as open PID infrastructure providers, we share a common goal. Uh, and among the goals that we share is uh, this goal of reducing administrative burden and increasing transparency in research and scholarly communication. So we want to make it faster and easier for everyone to do things that we think should be easy, uh, like submit grant applications and manuscripts, uh, make research open and monitor open access uh, and open science compliance. Should be easier to track re research outputs associated with a person or an institution or a funder. And there are just lots of things that we think could be made simpler, faster, easier, less frustrating. And of course, we are persistent identifier infrastructure providers. So we think that the way to do this is through use of persistent identifiers and high quality metadata, which enables machine readable connections. Um, so our organizations work together to ensure that we can support these machine readable connections to connect people, places, and things to help achieve uh, some of those goals that I just mentioned. Um, but it's up to all of us. So it's not just our organizations, DataSite, Crossref, ROAR, and ORCID, but up to the community, to you as well. Um, so these identifiers work together to help um, establish those connections along with high quality metadata, and it's important to use them together out in the wild. So in this presentation, uh, we'll talk a bit about um, what the, the grand vision, the grand pitified vision is, um, as well as steps that, that our organizations are taking and steps that you as the community can take to help realize this vision. So I will hand it over to Rachel to tell you a bit more about this grand pitified vision, but I will keep control of the slides so we don't switch back and forth too much. Cool. Um, thanks, Liz. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so I, I think I've, um, I've got the job of sort of setting the scene today and, um, and looking at, at where we are now. So if we move to the next slide. 
So we, at, at one point, whenever we were planning this presentation, we looked, um, we ambitiously looked at the entire um, research life cycle and thought about all of the ways that um, the different identifiers and metadata could interact within this and the workflows to, to make our lives um, to make our lives simpler and easier. And we thought that was probably a little bit much to get through um, in, um, in the time that we have today. Um, but obviously a lot of our work is relevant to places in the, the research life cycle. And we all work with, you know, I can see some familiar names in the, in the chat. So we, we have a lot of um, similar and the same organizations in our communities. Um, who deal with a mix of all or parts of these points in the cycle. There are lots of output systems, people involved, and I'm sure that even this very nice diagram doesn't even capture all of the aspects of the things that we're trying to look at, report upon, and the ways that we're trying to understand the ecosystem um, that, that exists around research. Um, as you know, where we stand today is that Many of these systems aren't connected and don't exchange information as, as, as neatly as they could. So that makes for work confusion, frustration, copy and pasting. And so, as I said, we can't tackle all of these stages in the session today, but we'd like to kind of zoom into one of those as a case study. So we've chosen to, um, to look specifically at, um, at research, reuse and impact. Um, to set the scene, um, Kai is the director of the research library at the new Arizona University. So she's our kind of um, our, our test subject for today. And to report on participation in open science among the, the researchers that she works with and the impact of that, she needs to be able to find information on the different research outputs from researchers at her institutions things like preprints, articles, data sets, software, and then also how they're being cited, downloaded and used. Next slide. So yeah, that's, 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 that's the aim. And again, I, I, we see this a lot across all of our communities, um, but the reality of approaching this type of analysis looks a little bit like these options. So buying kind of an, an all-encompassing um, research analytics tool, um, get researchers to fill out more reports in those different systems that don't exchange the information, get more people on board to help keep track of it all, um, or the searching for researchers in Web of Science and Google Scholar. Um, I spoke to a funder recently who, quite, who used the term sort of cyber stalking their researchers to be able to, to get information on their work relevant to what the the, they need to know. Um, I think someone in one of our calls also suggested that you could make it up, but for the purpose of um, sort of ethics, I'm not suggesting that as a viable option today. It lacks a bit of integrity. So how does a complementary system of e of metadata and persistent identifiers come in. So Julie, I think that's over to you. Yeah, thank Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so as Rachel just said, the, the kind of impact analysis that Kea is conducting for NAU could be far more efficient and dare I say delightful than cyber stalking your researchers, unless of course you're into that kind of thing. Um, but to see what this could look like, Let's follow one of Kea's researchers, Sofia Maria Hernandez Garcia, through a few workflows that are typical to researchers in their day-to-day -day lives. Next slide, please. Now, some of you may have seen Sofia before. She's in a lot of ORCID videos and things like that. But recently, she's been at a field project studying the rock layers around a meteor crater in Arizona. So she and her colleagues have gathered a lot of data that might help them understand why some of those rock layers are inverted. The project was funded by an award that requires its data to be made openly available. So she deposits that data and her code into GeoOpen, which is a data repository. So GeoOpen now has both Sophia's ORCID ID and her NAU ROAR affiliation. And when it registers DOIs for her data set and code, it includes that metadata with it. 
Later, of course, she's ready to publish some interesting analysis about those rock layers that might help solve some of the debate around the speed of the meteorite that formed that crater about 50,000 years ago. So she prepares her manuscript, citing both DOIs for her data and her code. And when she submits the article to the Journal of Intergalactic Geophysics, not a, not a real journal, but it should be, she adds her ORCID ID and NAU affiliation information, NAU's ROAR. So we're skipping over a lot of detail here about how this infrastructure can help out with the peer review process, but when, when JIG publishes Sophia's article, they mint a DOI for it via Crossref with metadata that includes her ORCID, NOW's ROAR ID, as well as the relationships to the data site DOIs for the related um, data set and code. Next slide, please. So in a perfectly pitified scenario, Kea is able to access Sophia's metadata her ORCID ID, as well as her publications, data sets, code, and other outputs via NAU's current research information system, or CRIS. This is really exciting for Kaya. It's going to save her time and reduce her administrative burden while she's creating reports and conducting the analysis that can help NAU understand the impact of its science. Of course, the ultimate goal is to help make Sophia and other researchers' lives easier. This complementary ecosystem of metadata and persistent identifiers helps ensure that her profile data gets to where it needs to be with minimal time or even thought on her part. So she can spend more of her time and her thought on her research, which I think is every researcher's goal. So I'm gonna pass it over to Liz uh, for a deeper dive into how all of this works together. All right, so with all of those connections to other persistent identifiers captured in DOI metadata, uh, connected to each other, information about Sophia Maria's works can now flow more freely between different systems and be reused ac across uh, different systems across the scholarly communications network. So for example, Sophia Maria's ORCID record is automatically updated with new work items for her article, as well as the data set and code. And those items in ORCID include the corresponding DOIs. Um, so not only can visitors to her records see these items in the ORCID user interface, um, these items can also be retrieved by anyone who uses the ORCID API. And of course, the ORCID uh, public API is openly available, meaning that basically any system that wants to can come and pick that information up from ORCID. More details about these individual works can then be retrieved from the Crossref and data site APIs using the DOI from Sophia's ORCID record. On the data site and Crossref side, um, we of course incorporate DOI metadata for Sophia Maria's article, as well as all of the other NAU researchers, other researchers she might collaborate with. Those are incorporated into Crossref and data site tools and services. Um, so, uh, there are certain tools and services that our organizations maintain, things like Crossref event data and data site commons, that then allow anyone who wants to, to come, come in and get information about, uh, for example, works associated with NAU's ROAR ID, um, along with citations and usage statistics. Those can all be retrieved using openly available APIs and tools like data site commons. Um, not only can you retrieve this information yourself from these tools, um, we have lots of other systems and organizations that consume metadata, both from Crossref and from Datasite, and incorporate those into their own tools and platforms. Um, so these persistent identifier connections make those tools and services work better as well. So as Julie mentioned, um, now Kaya's team has a lot of options. They can use openly available tools and data to find research outputs created by NAU researchers themselves. Um, they, can, uh, they can automate reporting. Researchers and staff don't need to re-enter data that exists elsewhere. And as I mentioned, other research analytics tools and services just work much better 
when persistent identifiers are used, they're connected to other identifiers um, and include high quality metadata. All right, so all of this is possible right now. Uh, well, kind of. Um, the plumbing actually is in place for all of for each step in this workflow that we just looked at. There are certainly repositories, um, data repositories that um, that do incorporate ORCID and RUR identifiers uh, into their DOIs that they're registering. Certainly, there are journals uh, that do the same thing. Um, and there are tools in place, as I mentioned, like data site commons, cross surf event data, where you can then pull those connections back out. Um, the piece that is missing at this moment is uh, complete widespread and broad adoption and implement implementation. So we have bits and pieces of this happening all over the place, but we need more in order to fully realize the pitified vision. So next up, we'll talk about uh, what our organizations are doing to, to help us realize that fully pitified vision and steps that you out in the community can take. So I guess if I talk about the, the sort of perspective of um, Crossref's community, and then I think we're gonna we'll, we'll jump we'll, we'll jump back, and I will um, put my hand up to to some of the things that we want to do at Crossref to better support this. Um, but I think one of the you know one of the key things is that um, the provision of that that kind of richer metadata that um, that Liz and Julie have talked about. So we can make links to we can do the. We can't auto update if we don't see ORCID IDs in the in the metadata. Um, we can't show make it easy for people to to search on affiliations if we don't have the roars in there. Um, we're pop information on um, grants, links to data and software. So all of that helps make these links between different research objects and and lets people know how how they can how they can be used or reused. Um, I think the other key thing is, um, you know, if we make the information openly available at Crossref um, via open APIs so that that will sort of populate information in systems and that the aim of that is to help sort of stop people having to rekey metadata. And that's a nice thing about making that openly available. You can combine it kind of with lots of other different sources to, to find the recipe that you need. Again, I think that's why we're all talking here because we can all provide kind of different pieces of that puzzle. Um, if the information isn't collected effectively, again, we, we, we all sort of run into to issues there. Um, there, there might either be gaps in the, in the data or, or poorly populated information. Um, so we, we want to work with systems providers and publishers to improve the integrations and collections of that information. And also sort of um, the, the working with researchers as well. And I'll come back to this later. It's, it's kind of the, the high. I think, you know, again, we're all trying to lessen the burden in terms of the, the information that we're asking people to provide. So be, to be able to, um, to be able to show the, the benefits that that confers upon the, the researchers, then I think that's kind of, that's, that's where we're all trying to get to so that it just becomes obvious of the, what providing this information needs. Um, the kind of zebra unicorns are, I guess my, my colleague Patricia's um, attempt to show, what some of the metadata is like and what it could get to in this kind of ideal world. All right, Paul, um, it's over to you. Thanks. And so uh, if you're if you're a data uh, a data site member um, registering DOIs or an institution or a service provider um, um, who provides uh, DOIs, then you should go beyond the basic requirements of the metadata fields that um, are in uh, the metadata schema, uh, which include uh, ORCID IDs, because no PID is in, 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 um, in itself. And um, you should definitely use the only authenticated ORCID IDs for the field of creators and contributors. Um, you should also um, 
have affiliations for those creators and contributors using raw IDs. Um, also, um, for the funding references, you should definitely um, use cross-rep funder IDs or raw IDs, as well as related for related identifiers. You should, um, yeah, put um, yeah such so as papers. You should always put them into the into the metadata. Next slide, please. And as what if you like, you only get out of uh, something like metadata what you put in. So um, then, as a next step, you um, we encourage you to uh, provide um, if you're a vendor or a service provider uh, to provide uh, fully support of all the fields that the metadata set, data set metadata schema offers. And in addition, we ask you uh, as a stakeholder to send user reports to data site um, so that we can uh, include them in our statistics of uh, our, our API, sorry. <clears throat> um, uh, last but not least, um, use the metadata, the data set metadata schema uh, uh, and the, the metadata such, uh, which is openly available through APIs to populate your, the information in your system. And um, so that people don't have to retype things, information um, in, in, that already exists. And now to Orchid, I guess. Hi again. So there are a few things as you can see here that ORCID member organizations or integrator organizations can do to help uh, put these pieces together. And collecting ORCID IDs within your services, making sure that they are authenticated so that they um, so that they add to the validated or the authenticated um, data metadata in an ORCID record. So there are a lot of services, third party service providers that have ORCID integrations right out of the box. Um, you might not know about that and you just need to turn it on. So that's something to check on. Um, we will have some contact information later on in this in this panel presentation and a little later Tom is going to talk some more about those but we also have a new affiliation manager that is available to ORCID consortium members only at this point um, that can allow very easy um, you to write very easily to ORCID records um, with just a CSV file. And our engagement team can help you integrate ORCID sign in with your homegrown services. So we really encourage you to reach out to your engagement team lead and, and talk to them uh, a little bit more about that. But there are also other things that you can do. Um, you encourage researchers to engage with persistent identifiers um, by making sure that they understand the added value for the researchers as well as yourself. So allowing researchers to use ORCID sign-in, um, nobody wants to remember an, yet another password. I think that the, the latest figures that I've taken a look at is, is the average, at least uh, Northern American person has somewhere between 130 and 150 um, accounts somewhere. So this just takes one of those off the plate and gives gives people a few less things to remember. Reusing information on researchers' ORCID records to pre-fill forms with names and affiliations. Um, can we? Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay. Adding information to ORCID records so that researchers don't have to rekey that manually, as we've been saying, um, reducing administrative burden. Is, is one of the key benefits to researchers. So any place that you can reduce their burden there is, is a huge win for them. Um, and also allowing it to be discovered or possibly reused by others, meaning affiliations, academic services like curation or editorship um, or any of the other credit roles that, that are now available on an ORCID record, funding information, peer reviews and, and research outputs. Um, all of these are possibilities. And explaining all of these to um, your researchers so that they understand um, why they're being asked to do things. And we can help you out there, which Tom will explain a little bit later. Over to Roar. All right, so as we've established, a main theme of, of today's presentation is it's all, it's all up to us and it's all connected. And Roar is, uh, Roar is an example of that as well. So there are many different 
stakeholders who all have an interest in clean and consistent affiliation data to, to better help tracking research outputs and their connections to individuals and other aspects of the research process. So there are a few different ways in which you all can help make the world a better place by having better and cleaner affiliation data. So if you are managing or are developing some sort of system that collects or manages organizational data using your IDs instead of a free text affiliation string is one simple way to do that. Uh, we are also um, very excited that those who send DOI metadata, the Crossref and data site can include ROAR IDs in the DOI metadata uh, to be able to establish those connections between research organizations and research outputs um, expressed uh, in, in that DOI metadata. Uh, also excited that ORCID will be supporting ROAR IDs for affiliations, and we can talk more about that bit later on. And uh, if you don't happen to have your own system, or if you don't happen to be a member of Crossref or Datasite or ORCID, you can also help support wider adoption of ROAR IDs in our infrastructure by encouraging publishers, repositories, and service providers to integrate with ROAR. So that is also very, very helpful. And so now that we've gone through some, some tips and, and blueprints for what you all can do to help make uh, the world a hitter place and enable this vision, we're going to uh, flip the switch a little bit and talk about what our respective initiatives are doing to support that as well. Cool, thanks. Um, thanks, Maria. So, um, I would put my hands up from the Crossref side and I would say that um, we're, we've been looking at ways that um, and devoting some time and resources in our various development sprints to looking at how we can better support ORCIDs. Um, that'll include things that, you know, like upgrading to use the, the most up-to-date ORCID API so that we can support um, different content types better. So preprints, um, in future grants and also just even you know simple things like looking at the messaging what do we what do we tell researchers whenever they get a message about um the fact that crossref seen an orchid associated with the published record so we're nearing i think two million authors granting us permission to to update their records um and that's about 85 percent of authors notified are granting granting permission so that's that's a really good story and those are the kind of integrations that we're really kind of we're, we're really kind of trying to encourage um so supporting that better we're building tools to help our members provide better more complete metadata integrations with open journal systems um and and stuff like that just helps make it easier for um for people to do that um, as Maria said, collecting ROAR IDs, but we also want to kind of extend that support for ROAR throughout our different systems, put it into our participation reports to tell folks how, how they're doing in terms of depositing metadata and providing um, in-kind resources to support ROAR. Um, data citations, we are in we, we are improving event data. There should be a blog about that tomorrow, but making sure that it is, that we shore up the infrastructure behind it and get the feed of references and relationships metadata that shows those citations from publishers to, um, to data repositories, really kind of getting that getting that going again. And there's obviously the, the advocacy element there to, um, to publishers to make sure that that happens adding new content types to support the things that people want to, to link to and, to and to identify persistently, participating in industry groups to, to, to play a role in that advocacy piece. And I think as well, you know, kind of, again, from, from our perspective as well, remembering the, the why that we're doing this and, um, and collaborating with um, other organizations trying to reach the, the same points to make sure that we're, we're not duplicating effort or um, initiatives that might be better, better handled elsewhere and collaboratively. So lots to do on our side as well. 
Paul, I think back to you. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. And as you can see with the picture, we are on a similar road as, as Crosshair is towards uh, a common goal of, uh, a, that means that uh, Peter world is, is not a utopia. And um, in order to do that, data set is um, improving um, several things like uh, the auto, auto, auto update that we are currently uh, working on as well as the certain link integration. Um, also, we have within our metadata schema, the support of relationships to raw IDs, ORCID IDs, and other UIs uh, and other identifier types. Um, we are building tools that uh, Liz already mentioned, such as Commons, um, which is then again built upon the PitGraph, which provides information only because there are also all of our um, PIT providers, uh, which open have open um, information, which is crucial, I think, to, to science that open science is only possible because of openness and, and the metadata that um, is within those open PIDs. Um, and we um, directly and indirectly support ROAR uh, through staffing uh, leadership um, and yeah, concrete infrastructure hosting and um, yeah, being a, a governing organization and partner organization of, of ROAR as an uh, open science infrastructure. And then we, not, last but not least, we are participating in, a com in community groups uh, such as uh, EOSC, uh, RDA, um, et cetera, in order to, to um, yeah, support and foster open science and open access and uh, data site adaptation and reuse. So it's uh, now over to Orchid, I guess. Great, thanks. I think I'll take this one. Um, so yeah, we've got quite a dense slide. We're, we're up to all sorts of things, um, but they're they're all kind of organised into these four strategic themes. So we're trying to focus our activities around increasing value um, and participation, whilst also maintaining trust and integrity. One of the most direct, straightforward things we're doing is integrating RAW. Um, that's gone live in our APIs very recently, so you can actually use RAW and Orchid together. We're just about to update um, and release an update to our affiliation manager which is part of our kind of member services stack um, and that's going to have raw in it um, very soon too and hopefully later in the year um, at the very latest I expect will be the early next year we'll be updating our user interface to, to also fully support raw and in fact hopefully moving to kind of a raw first view from Orchid so that we can reduce some of the confusion I noticed there was a question about that in the chat which maybe we can get to later in the questions um, the other things we're doing is we're just we're really trying to focus on our UX. Um, to, uh, there was another comment made about our UX being slightly out of date. We've just released an update to our public page. We're going to be updating our um, researcher pages where they manage their own information. But as part of that moving forward, now we've once we've got that done, we'll be able to put user experience elements that help guide people to the ways better ways of connecting their records and enabling that automation because what we want right is researchers to not even realize or have to interact much for this kind of the magic of pids to work what we want them to do is go okay i consent to, to you doing this for me and then we do it for them um so we're going to be help, hopefully building more user kind of workflows that make it as simple as possible to enable the automation that, that they actually want. Um, we're working closely with vendors. We see we've got, you know, as our membership at Orchid expands, it's getting harder and harder for us with a small staff to kind of manage all these, these individual relationships. And one of the things that we see is um, building your own integration is really, really, not really, really difficult. It's difficult though. Um, whereas if the systems you already use support Orchid or any of the other PIDs, um, it's a lot easier to basically turn it on than it is to build all this stuff again yourself. So we're focusing a lot of attention on working with vendor third party systems, however you want to call them, so that they fully support PIDs and, and use them in the way they're supposed to be used. Um, we're also continuing to explore new use cases and building out our tools to kind of help people um, execute the, the workflows and, and fulfill their use cases but most importantly we're trying to more and more talk to our users about what those key the, the, the key benefits that they see that PITS can provide and trying to fill in the gaps where we're maybe falling short um, and concentrating our efforts on what's actually really really useful rather than what just seems useful if that makes sense so yeah like I said we're doing an awful lot um, 
same as everyone else uh, working together to make to make this better essentially yeah so roar by design and from the very beginning has been developed and is being developed as a community driven initiative and that is one of the things that sets it apart from other types of organization identifiers that are out there. I, I just saw a question pop up about that and we can address it more during Q&A. But the idea is that ROAR is specifically addressing this problem of how to identify research affiliations in our infrastructure and that we are designing you know, the registry and ROAR IDs to, to be able to work very easily with other identifiers and other parts of our infrastructure, which is why ROAR IDs are being supported in Crossref and Datasite and ORCID. So this is, you know, being, being a, a collaborator with fellow infrastructure providers in this open PID and open metadata space is really important. And likewise, developing ROAR with extensive participation and input from a broad a uh, swath of, of the community and community stakeholders is vital as well. So we have a number of different community groups, which anyone is welcome to join to uh, be able to give feedback on ROAR and hear updates and get involved in various ways. Uh, so we try to be uh, as, as grassroots as possible in, in that regard. ROAR itself is being run as a community collaboration. It's not its own organization actually, but it's a collaboration between different organizations um, in this space, namely California Digital Library, Crossref, and Datasite. Uh, so developing this collaboratively and, and with a community uh, basis is, is important. Uh, we're also seeing uh, and are excited about ROAR being part of or included into national PID policies for research that are being developed. And that's um, definitely an, an interesting and exciting trend to, to witness right now. And lastly, we're working on building out different tools and documentation to support adoption and implementation of ROAR alongside other identifiers. I've seen some questions pop up about the ROAR API and other tools, and I'm dropping some, some links into the chat box and Q&A to help connect you to those resources if you haven't already seen them. All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, so that was a lot of information from a lot of different perspectives. So uh, to wrap it up and kind of bring it back to, uh, to where we started, um, our organizations are all committed to working together to make the world a, a pitter place because we know it's not just about DOIs or about ORCID IDs or ROAR IDs or you know, even data site or cross rev DOIs separately. All of these need to, uh, need to work together and be used together in order to enable the, um, the pitified workflows that we, that we discussed. And that requires um, that connections are made using metadata um, to connect all these different identifiers together. So we are continuing to work together and we um, are asking all of you in the community how you might uh, be able to, to help make the world a pitter place. Um, and I saw a question in the Q&A about, you know, what are the next steps? What do we need, what do we need to do? What are the first steps? Um, and, I, and so I think one of the, um, one of the key points here is it's about implementation in part, integrating uh, not just DOIs, not just ORCID IDs, and not just ROAR IDs, but all of these things into your systems and workflows. Um, of course, before implementation can even happen, there's a lot about policy um, around this. So your institutional policies for researchers and vendors, it's about funder and publisher policies um, for, for researchers which does require uh, advocacy for support of persistent identifiers generally. Again, DOIs, ORCID IDs, ROAR IDs, and other types of IDs um, so that they can all work in combination. So advocacy for support by system vendor vendors, um, support from publishers and funders as well. And I see there was a question about outreach to researchers as well, which I think, although we wanna to work toward this goal of automated, transparent, everything, there is still an element of outreach to 
researchers because that metadata component is so important. So in cases where, um, for example, we saw uh, Sophia Maria submitting her data set and code to a repository, um, some amount of engagement to make sure that folks are using their ORCID IDs, um, that they're filling out metadata forms completely. Uh, they don't need to necessarily understand everything about what goes on under the hood, but there are a lot of metadata fields that are optional if you're submitting a data set and it's a big long form. Um, and it's important to capture as much of it as, uh, as we possibly can, because that just makes all of these systems and connections work better. Could I add on to that really quickly? Sure. Uh, yeah. So from, from an ORCID perspective, that was a really good question. Why should we be educating researchers? Um, just, just adding on to what, um, to what Liz was saying, a lot of times we're finding that researchers don't really understand what the value is to them. And they maybe had to um, create an ORCID record um, just for the purpose of submitting a manuscript, for example, or applying for funding. And they did it out of necessity. They didn't really understand why they were doing it. And the truth is that ORCID record could be so much more useful to them if they made, if they enabled some connections, if they identified some trusted organizations. So until we get this critical mass of everybody just gets it, you know, every, you know, maybe it's being shared at an early part um, of um, a researcher's education, for example, um, there is some kind of um, adoption and advocacy that, that we need to do, at least from an ORCID perspective. Um, but that's a great question. We do eventually want it to be completely be under the hood and they'd never have to even think about it again. Thank you. Um, so I see we have plenty of questions and hopefully we'll have plenty of time to get those answered. Um, if you do need help or have, um, have more in-depth questions about uh, implementing a particular persistent identifier, you can contact us through our support uh, and information addresses. We will be posting these slides, as I mentioned, and, and the video, but let's get on to the questions because we have We have quite a few. All righty, so let's take this first one. So citation of data is very important to the community. As data publishers, we can include citations in data site metadata, but this is really the wrong way around. The direction of the flow of information about data citation should really be from the journals, but at the moment, few journals seem to be providing that information. How do we encourage more journals to start providing this data? Um, I'm wondering, Rachel, do you want to talk a little bit about how citation of, we'll say, data sets or, or code, things that might have data site DOIs, how that works in, from the Crossref perspective and how, what's, what's on the, what's coming up that might increase uptake? Sure. Yeah, it's, um, it, so from the as I said from the the crossref perspective the the journals can provide links between um between articles and data either in the relations um section of the metadata which is similar to to how data site supports this or they can put them in in reference lists um and i think we obviously we collect both of those things. We make them available via our um, our APIs. And the thing I think that we've been devoting quite a lot of time and effort to this year is making sure that those those relationships flow into both um, both sort of cross refs event data, but also into um, via our the the Scholix API endpoint that we support so that it can be used by all of the the folks who use Scholix. So I think that I think it's showing the how that stuff is actually used and making sure that we support that as well as possible helps kind of I think that sort of helps kind of push the needle along in terms of encouraging publishers to do that because I think the other thing that it helps us to show not in a kind of very grand, like in a in a wider and less granular way is which publishers are sending that information in and which 
and, and which ones aren't. And there are groups that we're working with who said we've been, um, we're working with WASPA along with the folks at um, CDL and make that account to, to work out how the resources that, that publishers need, both sort of educationally, so the policy side that Liz mentioned and also technically. And STM also have kind of a working group that are really trying to, they're really, they're trying to get publishers to, to have this as an area of focus within their organization so that the work to do this gets done. It's it's taking longer than I think any of us would have liked. And I agree that sort of supplement, making sure that that citations to data are regularly included in reference lists using identifiers is absolutely where we want to get to. So there, there's a couple of approaches that we're taking to really try to push that forward. Um, and the biggest thing is just advocacy to the publishers so that this gets to the top of the list or it is something that gets baked into journal policies. Yeah, I must say on the data site side, we don't have a lot of interaction directly with the, the publishers, but we are starting to get this sort of question from funders um, who ask us, okay, I, I know what to tell my researchers about you know, how they get a DOI for their data set, what metadata they need to add there. Now, how does it get into the publication? Um, so we're um, having some conversations with the, the funders once we can explain how does this work? Okay, it needs to go in the reference list. Um, we've had, you know, some, some successful cases where then, you know, funders in a specific area go off to the publishers and say, this is what, uh, this is how it works. Can you support this, this workflow? So that's one angle that we are, are working from. I think the, I know we've loads of questions. We're also working to add the collection of data availability statements into our metadata. So again, as you said, if that's the default way that publishers are doing it, then that should help us pick up more of these. No, okay, doke. Next up, uh, slightly concerned about the building the places we fly it nature of partial PID implementation, despite significant progress achieved so far. A real life open science reporting case study would be, for instance, include, would, for instance, include filtering by research funder, outputs of one kind or another that acknowledge funded projects by a given funder. How long will it take us to get there, i.e. PIDs for projects and funders, and wouldn't it make more sense in the meantime to use CRIS systems for reporting and making sure the data they, can, they contain is automatically synchronized and transferred into ORCID. Um, so I, I think this is something that we can probably all weigh in on. I would say um, the persistent identifiers for projects and funders uh, depends what you mean by project exactly, but funders, I mean, that exists already today. You can register uh, Crossref and data site DOIs that include funding information along with um, identifiers for funders. Um, you can also register, register um, DOIs for grants and reference those in, uh, in other DOIs as well. So, I mean, it's, I would say it's not, it's partially adopted, but it is fully implemented um, in terms of the infrastructure aspects of things. Um, but I will open this up to the rest of the the panel for your thoughts. So I, I could chip in. I think I think one of the things is like like you just said, Liz. A lot of the, this infrastructure is in place. You know, the the funder identifies and things like that. Um, but the fact that we as paid providers have built it um, doesn't mean that it's in use as much, or at least not in use in the places that that some people would like to see it in use and that's why we continue to kind of work with work with the vendor systems mainly that, that are that are responsible for making sure this metadata is populated correctly when people do things like deposit data sets or submit manuscripts so that this metadata is all linked up um, so i don't know when we'll get there but we do see small incremental gains year on year that, that mean we're getting more and better metadata as we go along. So it's mm -hmm. just a big, long work in progress, I think. Yep, I totally agree that it is more on the side of integration with external systems than, um, than with the PID infrastructure at this point, since so much of these pieces all exist in the infrastructure. It's more of an adoption and integration question yeah and and towards that i mean we're all doing 
we're all doing things to try and make it easier for people to do these integrations and we're all doing things around comms and case studies and talking to people and outreach to try and encourage encourage uh, various uh, systems to use it um and there's just always a little bit more to do unfortunately um getting back to to john's question where is the best place to start and of course we you know discussed throughout the presentation that it's not about one or the other but that does make for a complicated uh choice for an institution about you know where do i start is it with orchid ids is it with registering dois integrating roar where where to start i think our different organizations we may all have different perspectives on this on this question so I'm going to chip in again. So I'd say, at least from an orchid perspective, but I think it applies to everyone, is you start with things. If you want people to do things, start with something that's actually useful to the people that need to do it. I know it sounds quite simple, but if you if you want people to have an orchid ID, um, provide something that gives them value for creating it, and then they'll actually go off and do it. Um, and it's the same for, I'm sure, if you want people to deposit data or, or mint DOIs and things like this, if they have a reason that benefits them for doing it, they're much, much more likely to do it. So I'd say start by looking for those things. Yeah, I think a, a key here is um, once you, you know, start from a, sp a particular perspective, don't stop there. It's not just about adopting ORCID, it's about, you know, ensuring that DOIs are connected to ORCID records and that um, uh, RAR IDs are connected to ORCID records, and those are both into connected into DOI metadata. Maybe to add to this also is that the idea of um, I was talking about the utopia of, of the pit of world, but uh, we are all working also towards the goal that there is no dystopia of, of a of a world where there there are no pits, because that is that is the 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 thing we are heading at. If if institutions do not implement pits, then or I, I often try to explain to to institutions what would you do if there were no DOIs that they are currently working with. And imagine the same thing for all the other objects, like the raw ID or uh, the ORCID ID that we're talking about. And th this makes uh, makes it visible or um, people understand how important they are because they are currently already using um, have been using DOIs uh, for for decades now. And this is this is what they what most institutions want to implement. I, I do know that. They are eager to do so, and we, we, we as providers, pit providers, need to enable them. And this is what we're trying to do. But the other thing is that uh, those institutions, they need a lot of time because maybe of lack of resources um, to, to do so. So we, it's, it's not an effort that we as pit providers can do ourselves, but we need the whole community, um, as we've seen in the bubbles, that it's advocacy, um, policy, and implementation. But uh, the the goal should be that we're working working towards the the, the pit of world uh, as a utopia that may, might not remain in utopia, but the real world in the future. Okay, we have a suite of questions that are all kind of interrelated that I think are a really good um, a really good set of questions to to end on. So. I'll quickly summarize these. Um, here's about advice and strategies to, com to communicate about integrating these multiple PID APIs. Um, or ORCID Canada members are surprised that they need to learn not only to use the ORCID API, but cross-reference data site, which, um, which you may know have similarities, but also complete, you know, every API has its own um, idiosyncrasies and its own, you know, process of getting credentials. Um, so related, We'd appreciate guidance on overall ecosystem approaches across all PIDs. And finally, is the PID graph the way forward in integrating the various PIDs together with their respective linked metadata? And I think this is a, a great question for the, for the group that's assembled here. Uh, you know, what can we do collectively to make it easier to implement all of these different, um, different PIDs? So particularly the system integration uh, side of things. We're all working with some of the same 
um, service providers and vendors. And again, we have these, you know, slightly different APIs and different rules and different ways of, uh, ways of doing things. So do we have thoughts and recommendations on how to uh, how to make this easier for everyone? And from the data site perspective, um, we uh, we do see the the PID graph as a partial way forward. I would say in integrating the various persistent identifiers. That does I mean it's data site commons. It's based on uh, a service called the PID graph that does um, that does harvest data from from those various sources, and then it can be queried through a single um, a single API or a single interface. Um, that said, it's still under development. It's not perfect yet. It does not include all the crossref uh, crossref metadata yet. Um, that's what we are working towards. So that, for some situations and some instances, could be a you know a possible solution. I'm just going to talk quickly to John's question because it's specific, I think, to because it's from an orchid perspective, right? <clears throat> and and the, the 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 thing there is, um, when people look at orchid the metadata that we have in the orchid registry, it doesn't include, in some instances, it doesn't include um, specific pieces of metadata about works or data sets they'd like to have, and mainly this is a problem around co uh, other contributors than the record holder with with the thing in. Um, so that is something we're working on at Orchid, um, and we're hoping to, hopefully, some point next year, enable people to start enriching their own data if the contributors are missing. And we're also trying to point people at other services like Crossref or Data Site to make sure that metadata is complete within Orchid, so that people don't have to go in multiple places. But in the end, it is a very difficult story to sell, isn't it? That you know. You're not just doing one system you're doing three and we've always had this problem from the very beginning of um orchid and i remember working on odin when the data site was very beginning as well um and we've given that problem to crossref right by by us appearing um now they have the same problem because now they say well that information is somewhere else um and it's it's a it's a it's a perennial problem that we we just have to keep working on working out ways of making it easier I suppose. right and it's a, a topic that's appearing in the the data site uh upcoming strategic plan to you know look at ways how can we supplement the metadata that uh exists in data site without touching the the actual data site record how can we incorporate this metadata that we know exists in other sources that might contain you know those key missing mm -hmm. missing fields yep we're looking at that too <laughs> yeah, and I know, and we, yeah, I know Crossref are looking at that because we've been chatting about, you know, how we might actually do these kind of things and work together on these problems. So, yeah, it's, they're, they're great questions and it's not something we're, we're, we're ignoring. It's just tricky to untangle. We'd love to get there, though. Yeah, right, as you said, I... yeah, just to do it without duplicating the information, having to update it in separate places and making sure that we we add to it in ways that are add to in ways that are, are complementary. Yeah. So I will say I'm getting uh, getting prodded by Mary. We need to start the next session, but this was great. Thank you so much for the, for the questions. I know we couldn't answer all of them, but uh, we can take some of them over into the, to the PID forum. Paul posted the link and we will export the chat transcript. And I think if we see some, we can pull out some particularly good questions. We'll address those over in the in the PID forum. But thanks again for attending and thanks to all the presenters for, for this as well. Thanks everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.